I start by saying good morning, good evening. <laughs> so you know, when you start over, you don't know what you are doing anymore. Good evening, I said it's a great pleasure to speak in this distinguished gathering in this very distinguished university. I have been here a few times. I've always enjoyed the discussions here. It's very enriching always. And as I said, you guys must be very intelligent together uh, at this uh, university, and you must be even more intelligent to speak here. To MAIB in terms of like you know professors, lecturers, and so on. I wanted to acknowledge uh, the religion, politics, and globalization program uh, for sponsoring this, and I do greatly appreciate the uh, sponsorship. I want to particularly uh, acknowledge uh, Professor uh, Ron Hosner and uh, uh, Lynn Graber, uh, the program director, and also director of uh, Professor Ron Hosner is the director. And I uh, also, of course, uh, Professor uh, Dalyush Zahedi, who really actually uh, mediated this, this invitation. And I'm very grateful to you, Dalyush. Dalyush has been a great friend for a long time. And uh, I have always enjoyed talking to him. I've learned a lot from him. He's a very wise man. He, he knows exactly what he uh, is up to. Uh, tonight, I'm going to speak about the presidential election in Iran and U.S.-Iran relations. First, I have to tell you, no other program would be as fitting to sponsor this lecture as the religion, politics, and globalization. Religion, politics, globalization. These three words define the Islamic Republic and its entanglement. Religion, Islamic Republic, and theocracy. Politics, it is probably the most politicized state ever been, been created over the last 200 years, I means all over, from domestic to international. And globalization is, of course, Iran is a global matter. Whether we like it or not, Iran is a global issue. Every day you get up, you don't miss Iran in newspapers, in media, in, in, in everywhere. It is, Iran is, is global. And, uh, uh, and sometimes for, for the right reason, and some other times, and most of the time for the wrong reason, unfortunately. And it is, it is because of that that I have also, as a candidate for president in Iran, have taken this campaign to global scene. As, as Kevan said, from Northern Ireland to Scotland to London to Dubai to here uh, to Virginia Tech and to many other places that we will go. And I think it is fitting to speak about Iran in all of these places. And of course, we will be going back to Iran soon, by the end of this month. And we started there, actually from there. And as I said, it's a, it is, Iran is a global matter, and it is, this campaign has to be global because the, not just the Iranian people, but the international community has a stake in a better Iran. They really do have a, a, a stake in, in fact, international community is taking a bigger stake in a better Iran than even Iranian themselves. Just look at this, this population here. It's just amazing. All right, so, but before uh, I move on to the lecture, let me recognize today, which is the International Women Day. I wanted to send my greetings to all women throughout the world, and of course the Iranian women, to respect what they have done and to stand behind them for what they are trying to achieve. I think the Iranian women have done a lot. They still need a lot to do, and I'm sure they will. I think I also want to ask you for a minute of silence in honor of all the Iranian and non-Iranian women throughout the world. They have lost their life or have suffered as they have fought for the rights of women throughout the world. Please, one minute.
pension. Uh, there would be no better day to speak in this place than a, a day like this, but also the day like this also has its own cost. <laughs> Today we are competing with another major event that the Iranian women have organized in San Francisco. Hundreds of Iranian women have got together in uh, the Palace of Fine Arts. As we speak here, they are gathered there. Unfortunately, we had no idea that such an event is going to happen. And we, uh, obviously, I, we should be there and I should be there uh, listening to them. But um, it happened and that's, uh, I'm also honored that this, uh, we are here talking to you. And uh, uh, I wish you all uh, good luck. And again, as I said, nobody can compete with women. And we don't live to do so as well. This has happened this way. And uh, we just have to stay with it. Uh, I wanted to bring this discussion to you uh, uh, within the context of this upcoming elections in Iran this June, and of course U.S. Iran relations. I believe that the presidential election in June will prove to be another turning point in the life of the Islamic Republic. That will not be uh, an average, average election as usual. Again, I'm not saying that would be very much like what happened in 2009 after the disputed presidential elections, but I think it is going to be an election that we need to watch. Check. There are several reasons why this election is very, uh, very different from previous elections. The simple fact is that Iran today and tomorrow, by June, will be very different from Iran of the Islamic Republic any time before this day. Let me summarize first what the Islamic Republic faces, and then go into detail to some extent. I will not speak too long because I really wanted to have this uh, meeting, uh, uh, sort of a, a discussion meeting. <coughs> the Islamic Republic, as it approaches the next election, has three very specific and very obvious problems, not theoretical, I mean real, practical problems. Problems. Number one is what I call factional infighting. Factional infighting. The Islamic Republic, factional infighting is nothing new in the Islamic Republic, but as I will tell you in a second, this time, factional infighting in the Islamic Republic is qualitatively different from any previous factional infighting that the regime has experienced. In fact, factions today are not rivals or competitors, they are enemies. Number two is, of course, the conflict with the United States of America. Again, I have spent 27, 8 years, day and night, on this particular problem, trying to make peace between the two countries. And as uh, my friends on you say, I have sort of faith. But I have to tell you one thing I wish. I believe in process, not just in result. That is, when I started 20 some years ago on U.S. Iran relations, believe it or not, and Darish knows better than I do, that probably not even 5% of the Iranians, inside or outside, thought I have any mind. That they thought I am crazy, that I am lunatic. That the guy who have come up and wanted to bring the U.S. and Iran back together after a revolution that throw the, country, the U.S. out of the country, took American hostages, and all of this stuff, and now here, Hussein Amir Ahmadi is trying to bring them back together. I did not even have support from 5% of the population in Iran, and perhaps even outside the country. But today, I can proudly say that over 85% of the Iranians want this relation normalized. They want a destination come together. That's my achievement. 
from 5% to 85%. You know, I don't want it to be said a great man. Said great man is uh, someone who doesn't solve problems, but keeps the big problems as big problems until they are solved. I have kept this relationship as a big issue on the table for both sides, and it will be one day resolved, and I will be honored when it happens. So, but unfortunately, as again, as you said, that relationship is hit. It's bottom. As never, U.S. relation has been so bad. Never before the Islamic Republic and during any elections has been under economic sanctions of the type that it is now. Sanctions on oil, central banks, other banking system, SWIFT system is all cut off to the country and the rest of it. So that's another issue. And the third issue, of course, economic problems that directly emanates from, originates from, the factional infighting and relations with the U.S. <coughs> and by economic problems, I mean industrial decline, I mean high unemployment sometimes for the youth, 40%, and I mean high inflation is for some commodities, 40% some to 400%. You know, the plunge of Iran's currency, almost three and a half times relative to only six months ago. Increased poverty and the rest of it. One big problem that the Islamic Republic faces is that these three problems are interconnected. That it cannot resolve any of the problems without the other problem being resolved. For example, U.S.-Iran relations will not go anywhere until actions in the regime come together on a decision as to what to do with it. Some people say, well, all, all you need is to have the Ayatollah Khamenei make a decision. Wrong. It's not that easy. It's not just like Ayatollah Khamenei can come and say, OK, let's go and have this relation resolved with the U.S. There are all, there are all kinds of you know, climates there. There are people out there that that demand a different course of action or direction. Economic problems will never be resolved in the Islamic Republic until the U.S.-Iran relation is resolved. Or even the factional politics, because the factional politics directly impacts economic policy, creating inconsistencies in economic policies, and throwing, basically discouraging investment and the rest of it. So these three issues are interconnected, and they not only just interconnected, they act upon each other, each other, creating a vicious circle. A vicious circle that goes down and down in terms of like uh, its impact on each other. Factional infighting, the more it goes up, U.S. relation gets troubled. As long as the U.S. relation is moving in a direction that is going in the wrong direction or the negative direction, factional infighting is intensified, the economy is also further, you know, will suffer. And as long as the economy is suffering, there will be all kinds of problems that faction are going to bring against each other, from corruption charges to the rest of the other stuff, making uh, factional infighting even worse or more intensified. Now, what really the Islamic Republic therefore needs moving forward, just as a conclusion before I open up, it needs someone in the next election as president, to be elected as president, who really is a bridge builder that can bring the factions together. That's a peacemaker that can make peace with the United States and is an economic manager that really can manage this economy. But then again, that person has to have this three expertise because all of these three problems are interrelated. You have to have that, that particular person. Now, on the factional infighting, as I said, the Islamic Republic uh, has had always factional problems. In the beginning it was the, the, the Islamists versus the nationalists, the left, secular left, and, and so on. Then the religious left. And then the problem moved to the, the right versus the, uh, the reformists, even later on the moderates. And now the factional infighting has moved further inside the regime within the right. 
that is within the power block that controls the country. The Islamic Republic resembles like a, a boss that to me is like on cruise control. And it is going in the direction, okay, that is really wrong and in fact it is going toward a cliff. But this is much bigger than the American Pittsburgh cliff. You remember that Pittsburgh cliff? But this is a completely different cliff. God forbid if it goes in there, it will hardly ever come out. This boss is that uh, this boss wants self, you know, as an autopilot or, or, or cruise control, needs a driver. Jump in, take the steering wheel, put the brake, and change the direction. That is the person you need. But then the factions are fighting each other, and nobody is really jumping. Or anybody who will jump the other side will actually, you know, prevent them from taking the steering wheel that they are fighting over so many other things. Now, what the fight is out there? Well, the right is now obviously fighting for control of the state power. But also, they are fighting for the direction of this revolution called the Islamic Republic, an Islamic revolution, as to which way it's going to, have to go, for example, in relation with the US. As I was saying, different factions within the right, one faction is now saying, OK, now let's make peace. And others say, no way, over my dead body. All right? And then, beyond that, there is the economic interests that over time have been built in the system. Different factions have become like tribal groups, and each have developed their own uh, sort of mafia centers, if I may say that, and uh, creating serious trouble within the system. And, uh, uh, and each of the, uh, of the faction basically simply keeps uh, uh, accusing the other uh, of, of the problem. Now, the result of all this, obviously, uh, has been uh, three things, in my view. One, a blockage in U.S. Iran relations. There is, no, there is no discussion. Whenever there is a discussion, it gets blocked because factions cannot work together uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a particular direction. Second, as I said, uh, the, the, uh, the consequence for the economy, complete lack of consistency in economic policies, macroeconomic policy, microeconomic policy, industrial policy, trade policy, all of this. Doesn't matter, monetary, fiscal, they're just uh, they are daily, weekly, or at best monthly, and it cannot operate in a, uh, in a macro uh, economic environment of that sort, or even uh, you know, in a microeconomic environment that the industrialist needs to invest and has to take a long view of what's going on in the country. It just doesn't happen that way. Beyond that, I think this uh, factional conflict as I said, has over time intensified also the relationship between the regime as a whole and its political opposition outside the regime. As I said, the reformers, the moderates, the older nationalists, the secular left, and everybody else that is in outside the country or inside the country. And they are all over uh, trying to uh, find a way to deal with the regime, as uh, uh, some of them are for uh, the regime change and others are for war, uh, and, uh, and then are also others who are for a different course of action, uh, like me, who takes a seal that the best way to go is to uh, election process. <coughs> we talked about it, and I, I would be pleased to take a question on that. I know there is a lot of questions as to whether that is at all feasible and is possible, whether that's realistic, and, and, and the rest of it. Now, but blockage of the U.S. relation has had its own problems. Obviously, the obvious example are sanctions of all type on the economy, you know, on the oil sector, on the banks, and so on. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the consequence of this factional fighting, as I said, what, what management of the country is being mismanaged significantly. Uh, again, they cannot agree on anything, and they just move here and there. And the polarized politics. Now, on the U.S. Iran relations, uh, we all know what it is to some extent. <coughs> U.S. Iran relations, the problem goes for almost 30 some years now. It started really with this 1979 revolution, although uh, 
one could argue that probably the roots of the problem, uh, you know, goes back to 1953 coup. But I, have, I argue that that is not really the case. That is, 1953 coup really was not and is not an issue uh, in the U.S. Iran relations between the Islamic Republic and the United States. Not that it is not an issue between the Iranian people and the American people. Ladies and gentlemen, even today, when I, I am speaking here, there is not a single street, okay, in the name of Prime, Prime Minister Mossadegh that the, uh, that the CIA uh, overthrew. I mean, the Islamic Republic is so <laughs> concerned about the 1953 coup, it must at least acknowledge the man who was overthrown with the name of a street or something, an alley, anything, absolutely zero. So that's all about height, that's all about, I mean, this is not really true, that's uh, I will tell you later on what the problem is. As you know, on the surface of it, uh, the problems are uh, said uh, is very straightforward. America have usually four problems on the table for Iran uh, uh, to, uh, to address. One, obviously, I mean, again, I have to say that these problems over time have had different priorities and the relation has been differently, you know, uh, you know, viewed. For example, there was a time when uh, the, the peace issue was a big problem. The peace between the Arabs and the Israelis, or Palestinians specifically, and Israelis. No more, that's a, a big issue in U.S. Iran relations. Then it was the terrorism, the support for terrorism, Hamas and Hezbollah. As you can see, that is not today the top priority. Today, the biggest issue between U.S. and Iran is nuclear enrichment, uranium enrichment, the nuclear program. So if I was to uh, list the three, four problems that the U.S. has with Iran, is the nuclear issue, terrorism, peace between Palestinians and Israelis, and of course, human rights, uh, and so on. Now, I believe, I believe none of these problems are serious. None of the problems are U.S.-Iran relations problems. First, not all issues that I just said, all four issues are negotiable. There is absolutely not a single issue in U.S. Iran relation that cannot be negotiated. If they are not negotiated, it's not because of the problems themselves, because of some other stuff, they have to come to it. Second, these issues, nuclear, terrorism, peace, human rights, Ladies and gentlemen, are not just U.S.-Iran relations problems. These are the problems of our time. These are the problems of our age, our global issues, human rights. Regardless of what you think about the Islamic Republic, human rights is not just the Islamic Republic's problem. Some of our best friends in the region, including Saudi Arabia, all right, or many of the other Gulf states, they don't even have elections. They don't even have constitutions. Islamic Republic at least has an election that choose. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see Saudi Arabia, you know, uh, organize an election and choose. Honestly, I would love to. I would love to. See? <laughs> Peace between Arabs and Israelis or Palestinian and Israelis. Ladies and gentlemen, before the Islamic Republic was born, Arabs and Israelis had three wars. Thanks God, since the Islamic Republic has been born, there has not been a single war between Arabs and Israelis. So let's make the Islamic Republic completely responsible for the lack of peace between Arabs and Israelis. Someone has to take responsibility for the first 30 years of that conflict. Who? Oh, that was an Islamic Republic. And that wasn't in Iran even, because Iran, the Shah of Iran was the friend. So who? So that's not, cannot be a serious issue. Terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last 10 years that we have been fighting terrorism, global terrorism, what do you mean by global terrorism? They mean Al-Qaeda and its close friend, Taliban, both of which were created either by us or our friends. Let's face it, in, 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 in Afghanistan. Islamic Republic has suffered from Al-Qaeda and Taliban significantly. When Taliban took over Afghanistan, the first act they committed was to murder eight Iranian diplomats in Mazar-e-Sharif. 
Today, even today, these radical Sunni groups are enemy number one of the Shia Islamic Republic. When we call about terror, we come and say about terrorism, we really mean Hamas and Hezbollah. But I have to say very openly, clearly, that of course any force, including Hamas and Hezbollah, which commits murder against innocent people is a terrorist. Particularly when they go and murder the, the Israeli kids or, or, or blow them off. But, the, but terrorism, we mean something different. As I said, we mean Hamas and, not Hamas and Hezbollah. We mean really uh, the Al-Qaeda and Taliban. You remember there was a time when we used to uh, call PLO a terrorist. We would not talk to them because they were terrorists. Its leader, Yasser Arafat, was a terrorist. And you remember later on that he became uh, a democratic guy. PLO became a, a regular, you know, uh, uh, organization of the state and so on. So again, what I'm saying is the terrorism perhaps, there is something in there, but it is not really the issue again. And finally, the nuclear issue. As I speak, eight countries in the world have nuclear power, nuclear bombs. Five of them are in the Iran's region. China, Russia, India, Pakistan, and Israel. Iran is right in the middle. Nobody so far, including the U.S. government, its intelligence service, have ever said that Iran is building a bomb. Neither International Energy Atomic Energy has ever said that. Please don't misunderstand it. What they say is that we don't know what they are doing. That is, IIEA cannot say Iran is not doing that. That's different from saying it is doing it. That's very different. So please watch the words and the game that being played with words. Now, they think that Iran is intending to develop at least a capability. Again, I don't know. I can assure you CIA doesn't know. And I can assure you nobody else does. You know why? Because we still have to create a machine that measures intention. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a great university, and you are very, very intelligent young people. If I was you, I would put the rest of my last, next 10 years, put it in a machine that measures intention, and you would become a billionaire. Okay? <laughs> so if you want to become the next Bill Gates, go build a machine that measures intention. Okay? So that's where we are now. Now, I also have to say this. I don't know what the Islamic Republic is doing. I personally think the Islamic Republic should not build bomb. I am not for it. But I do think that the Islamic Republic must be allowed to exercise its right to enrich uranium for peaceful purpose. But just like with all rights comes obligations. But the Islamic Republic must observe every single obligation that it has made by signing the MPT and its safeguard agreement which basically the bottom line is transparency. The bottom. The Islamic Republic, I think, has made serious mistakes on the transparency issue. And they have not been always transparent. They say we weren't transparent because we, unfortunately, were afraid of the American sanctions. And therefore, we, we went into hiding and did what we had to do uh, as our rights. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what, all right? Now, I can drink this, I have every right to drink it, whether it's a, it's a mosque or any place, to drink it now. But what if, if I take this and go under the, the here and I start drinking? What do you think about it? You say, hey, this guy is drinking water. <laughs> After all, it, it looks like water too. Okay? That's exactly what the Islamic Republic did. He took the water and went underground to drink and made that into a vodka for Americans. <laughs> That was a big mistake. They are paying the price. If I become the president of Iran ever, I will certainly make that particular uh, mistake go away. The biggest problem between U.S. and Iran, ladies and gentlemen, is lack of trust. And the lack of trust developed just 
one because of this, uh, that, that very simple example. But there is more into it than I will explain to you in a second. I think the future of warfare technology is not nuclear. Nuclear is already obsolete. It's about 70, 80 years old as a technology. Unfortunately, what is happening in the world is even a more serious, troubling, dangerous development that we call cyber technology. I can assure you, in about 15, 10 to 15 years, the Americans and many countries will have the, the capability to destroy, Americans will have, for example, the capability to destroy Russian bombs as they sit in their storages in Russia. That's where we are going. The most troubling development of our age is cyber technology. It is only unfortunate that just like nuclear technology, which was supposed to be for peace and went to the war side, that this cyber technology is going to be going to the war side. It's only unfortunate. And I think I can see that, that in the near future, university campuses will develop protest movements against cyber technology. You will see it, and I tell you, if I was the president of Iran then, I would be in the forefront of that movement. But I would also tell you this, that as president, when I, when I stop nuclear technology, I would certainly develop cyber technology, but for not warfare, for peace purposes. It's a great technology, just like good computer software. The, the biggest problem with that software technology is that like the software, it is endless, absolutely endless. The biggest thing about software technology is it's endless. It is a software that makes the hardware obsolete in technology. It's not the hardware, I mean, in computer technology. So the software uh, is, the, is the future in the, in the, in the warfare uh, you know, side. So again, what I'm, I'm saying is that that's the problem. But the question really is why the US and Iran cannot come together? Iran, of course, has also its own problems with the US. It says, oh, you, you, know, you have taken my assets and frozen it in this country. You shot my civilian plane. You helped Saddam Hussein, you know, to impose a war on me, and you su you supported the Shah to impose a dictatorship on the country for thirty some years, and I suffered. And the fact is that many of the leaders of the Islamic Republic today were in prison under the Shah, including Khamenei, the leader, including Rafsanjani, the second guy who used. To so, they have that problem. But you know, I think, I think there is one thing that stands between the two countries that really is troubling, and that's exactly why it makes this relationship that much difficult. And that is a revolution. It's called Islamic revolution. We forget that a revolution happened back in 1979. We forget that the Islamic Republic is still revolutionary. We forget that the leaders of the Islamic Republic also are revolutionary. In fact, just two weeks ago, Abdullah Khamenei, the leader of the Islamic Republic, in response to mm -hmm. Vice President Joe Biden on negotiation, he had a very simple statement. He said, listen, I am not a diplomat. I'm a revolutionary. And therefore, that exactly is the I am not a diplomat, I'm a revolutionary, so I talk just like a revolutionary. And he means he is a revolutionary. We forget that he is a revolutionary. We think he is just like many, many of others uh, you know, controlling the state now. Now, why a revolution is uh, such a critical stuff and the problem? Very simple. That revolution was anti-American from the day one and remains anti-American. Whether we like it or not, I'm talking about the revolution. And you know what? It just happens that Americans also don't like revolutions. And I mean American, I mean the state, I mean the, 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 the policy makers. It's sometimes it really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised sometimes with that uh, sort of like attitude from the political elite in this country because we are very proud of our revolution, you know, in this country against British, for example. And we are very proud of our revolution. We are a revolutionary country. 
Now, what happened that he became so anti-revolutionary? I don't know. Someone has to really go and study to see what happened to the American that from a revolutionary country became so much like anti-revolutionary. But whether we like it or not, the fact is that neither the revolution likes the, likes the US nor the US likes that revolution. It's a two-way street. And as long as the American see the Islamic Republic through the prism of that revolution, there is no way out. And as long as the Islamic Republic views the United States through the prism of that revolution, there is no way out. And in fact, unfortunately, both sides have got used to seeing each other through the prism of that revolution. The only hope is that they will take that glass out, the revolutionary glass, and both sides, that prism, change it, and come with a new, completely different uh, mindset. And that requires, of course, a paradigm change. And you know what? I don't know whether President Obama can do it, but I know Mr. Khamenei cannot. Why cannot? Because his legitimacy is depends on that revolution. Without that revolution, without that anti-Americanism, he has nothing to offer to the Iranian people. He, has, he didn't offer democracy, he didn't offer an economic development, he didn't offer them, you know, prosperity, what else he has? He offered one thing, anti-Americanism, and they are very proud of it because for them anti-Americanism means independence. It means independence, and in Iran, and countries like Iran, unfortunately that word independence is a magic word, as if they really are liberated. And by independence they have a very subjective view of it. For 30, 30 years, the Islamic Republic had nothing to do with the United States, and still they think they are dependent on the U.S., or if they just open up a little bit, the U.S. would take over and make them into a dependent state. Well, that's the way they are thinking there, that the fact of that. Now, the last issue, is the economic issue. Unfortunately, as I said, because of the factional infighting, which led to economic uh, policy inconsistency and mismanagement, corruption and the rest of that. And because of the conflict with the United States, which had led to sanctions, destabilization policies, you know, and the rest of that. The Iranian economy is suffering, as I suffered, and it crippled, and is going down every day. In short, economic mismanagement and sanctions are the cause of this economic decline. And by economic decline, I mean decline in national production, which has led to high unemployment, high inflation. Sanctions obviously have created problems for uh, foreign currency early. Iran's oil sector earns somewhere about 65 to 70 percent of Iran's foreign currency. And Iran, Iran imports about 57 to, well, 55 to 57 billion dollars in imports from food to industrial inputs to capital goods, and particularly food and industrial inputs. And you don't have foreign currency, you just can't get them. Again, Iran's, over the last six, seven, eight months, Iran's oil income has been cut to half. It's about now, as we speak, in the area of 40 billion, compared to about 80 plus billion dollars. As I said, Iran has 57 billion dollars Okay, of imports every year. So you already see there is a problem out there, problem out there. And unfortunately, because of dependency on the oil, Iran never really developed its non-oil income in this state. Tax, for example. In this country, we pay 37% of our, our income, our no, sorry, 37% of our GMP goes into taxes. In Sweden, it's about 56%. In Europe, it's about 45%. In Iran, is less than 10%. In Saudi Arabia, it's almost zero. <laughs> so that is very true. Okay. So this country's 
You know, Saudi Arabia is basically an oil company, what I'm saying. That's what you do. Iran is a little bit better, but uh, still, uh, when the oil income derives, the government becomes beggar. When you are a beggar and you have to maintain the state of the situation there, economy, you start printing money, that is to say, to deficit spending. And we all know deficit spending means more money in the streets, and that means inflation, because that's, a, that's not really real growth. Okay, and particularly the Islamic Republic, particularly the first Ahmadinejad, he, what he did also, he took some of this money and gave it to the poorer people, which I think he did right. But then again, by the very subsidies that he expanded, he created an economy that is unproductive and superficial, and just a demand that doesn't have any basis. So, I don't want to make this an economic uh, you know, lecture, I will keep a lot of time for that, but the bottom line is this, that Iran's economic problem, again, is manageable, but then it really needs a complete shift in its management style. Ladies and gentlemen, Iran is one of the richest, one of the richest countries on the earth. Iran is not a poor country. Iran is the fourth largest reservoir of oil, the second largest reservoir of gas. It has all kinds of minerals, it has 75 million people, of which 65% are below 35 years of age, of whom at least 15 million are university graduates, and many of them are women, 65% of the university population graduates are women in Iran. So that's what those men don't pretend to stand up for. Iran has a vast, vast geography, a huge market, so Iran has everything. Iran has everything it needs to develop. But you know, the gap between this reach and the achievement is tremendous. There is a few countries in the world that I can name that has such a wide gap between its reaches and its achievements. Iran is way richer than, let's say, South Korea. Relative to Iran, South Korea is a poor country, resource-wise. And you, saw, and you know where South Korea is today. As South Korea is moving the way it is, Iran is moving increasingly toward North Korea. That's true, it's unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I, under my presidency, Iran would become the South Korea of the Middle East. Absolutely. The North, and it can be easily made into a, a North South Korea of the Middle East. In fact, back in 1980, when the revolution happened, Iran was ahead of South Korea. I'm a South Korean specialist. Some of my PhD students uh, you know, teach at the North the South Korean universities. I visit the place quite a bit, and I know what I mean. South Korea, back in 1980, in 1980s, was behind Iran. Iran was a much better place, even industrial wise. So we have a long way there to go. I wanted to uh, wrap by saying that uh, I basically said that Iran faces three problems. Uh, factional infighting, conflict with the US, economic malaise. These are interrelated, interconnected problems that the solutions cannot be you know, isolated. They have to come together, and that means and I think if I was to put the priority on solving one of them, I would put the U.S. foundation on the top, because you really have to solve that problem before you can help with anything else. But then again, as I said, that problem is blocked by the factional infighting to a large extent. I think uh, Iran is a very rich country; it can be managed easily. In fact, as I said, about that was the autopilot or the cruise control. I have to tell you one thing: the, the nation of Iran has been on autopilot for several centuries now. I don't know who really managed that country. You know, I, 
It's, uh, it has been a, the most managed country ever. You know, the dictators after dictators and absolute powers after absolute power. I just finished a book on the political economy of Iran under the Qajars, which, uh, which, you know, which were around there in Iran from 1800, basically almost, to 1920s. And I, it's about the, the major book is available at the, um, uh, you know, it's called the political economy of Iran and the Bajar. It's available at, uh, uh, in Amazon and everywhere places. It just came out last summer, end of the summer. I show away in detail why Iran became what it is today. The one question really I wanted to answer is that question. I think if you are interested in, in that answer, read that book. The answer, the question was very simple. Why Iran? The three thousand years of Britain history and civilization in the 21st century should have a theocracy. Why should Iran be governed now with a monarchy? Think about it. Iran has its own constitutional revolution back in 1906. Constitutional revolution back in 1906. In 1909, the Iranian people hanged and stoned the biggest Ayatollah of the time, Sheikh Bazaldan Nuri, because he was against the Constitution. Exactly 70 years after, I mean exactly 70 years after, the Iranian went and brought back a modern Sheikh Bazaldan Nuri, Ayatollah Khamenei. And they saw his picture in the moon. It was seen as a second You ask yourself, what happened to this nation? That's that the question I answered in that book. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finish by just saying this. Iran needs, moving forward, a bridge builder, a peacemaker, and economic manager developer. It just happens that over the last 30 years, I have been doing exactly that. First, I have never been, I have never been a member of any political body. I've never been a member of any faction. I've always stood above all factions. In fact, today, Ahmadinejad and Larijani are more and more enemical than Ahmadinejad vis-a-vis -vis -vis me or Larijani even vis-a-vis -vis me. I am more friendly than they are with each other because I've never been involved in that politics. And I dislike that politics. That's a tribal politics. Second, I have spent 20 some years on US Iran elections. I know. Everything in this relationship, inside out, I have taken messages back and forth, I have done all kinds of stuff. I know every player, every issue, and every possible solution. And I tell everybody, if I become president, I will be shaking hands with President Obama in the first hundred days of my presidency. And I mean it. And I mean it. That's perhaps one reason why I will not become president. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, finally, my friends, but I have to tell you, honestly, I'm not to answer that question. People who, people who do not take this campaign seriously or, you know, they uh, uh, think that we have no chance are wrong. I tell you why they are wrong, not only because of the problems that I just explained, that are really serious problems, but a very simple fact, Iran, ladies and gentlemen, is a land of surprises. It's a land of surprises. If you ever go out there and predict a country, I can assure you, you go out of business. Don't predict Iran. If you are an Iranian scholar or a student of Iranian studies, learn one fact. Never predict a country. How many people taught the Shah of Iran back in 1978? How many Iranians or outsiders ever thought that the Shah of Iran will not be there in a year, in 1799? Almost zero. How many politicians, experts, you know, uh, policy makers ever thought that would be a 19, in 1979 there would be a revolution called the Islamic Republic? Islamic Revolution. Almost zero. And you know, how many predicted Khatami become president? Or Ahmadinejad become president? Again, very, very few, if not zero. So don't write it off, this election, 
and don't write up Mr. Pesky. Okay? And I thank you very much. I am looking forward to your questions. I wanted to finish by thanking my friend, uh, Professor uh, Zahedi again, and I also have to say the disclaimer, this is an academic event, and this is an academic conference. At the discussion, if I have a little bit, you know, dip toward the campaign and so on, and my apologies to all of you guys, and I didn't mean to say it, but the problem is when you talk about the Iranian election, you just cannot talk anything but the reality, and also, after all, I am a candidate. <laughs> 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 okay, thank you very much.